All right, we are now recording. Welcome to Behavior Management 101 for Parents. My name is Christine Stallone. I am a BCBA with uh, BPI. I've been a certified special education teacher for 12 years. I just recently completed my master's in applied behavior analysis back in May, and I became certified in August. We have to sit for a board exam. So I became certified in August. I am loving every minute of being a BCBA. I am also a mom of a very energetic 16-month-old daughter. Um, so she is definitely keeping me on my toes. So I have a poll that I'm going to go ahead and pop up on your screen. If you could answer the question, it's just how old are your children? If you have multiple children in different age ranges, you can select multiple different ages. So you guys should be able to see the poll on your screen now. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end polling in about 10 seconds. Oh, so we have a seven to 10 year old, a 10 to 15 year old and an adult child. That is awesome. Do we see any more popping in? Wow, so all older kids on this presentation. Mine is very, very young. So awesome. So I'll go ahead and share the results with you guys. So now you can see the poll results. All right, let me go ahead and stop sharing. Perfect. What is ABA? So ABA stands for Applied Behavior Analysis. It is the study of behavior. Applied is, means that it's socially and developmentally significant. Behavior is everything that people do, including the way we act, what we say, think, and feel. And analysis means that we use effective research-based interventions to guide our decisions when we're developing programming. So does the environment affect our behavior? I'm going to go ahead and launch another poll. I'd like you guys to answer the question of how you think. Does the environment be affect our behavior? So go ahead and answer, yes or no. I'll give you about 25 seconds to answer. Ooh, results are in, and both of you think that the environment does affect our behavior. So let's see. And you're right, of course it does. Some common examples of this is the room temperature. So if it's really cold in a room, what do you do? You go and you grab a jacket. If you're hot, you take some layers off. Another example would be the seatbelt warning in your car. So you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you hear that ding, 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 and it signals you to change your behavior and put your seatbelt on unless you're like me and ignore that ding, 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 and it just becomes background noise and then your husband yells at you. <laughs> um, the next one is that how we drive in the presence of a police officer. You see I've happened immediately, your hands are 10 and two, you're looking straight ahead, you're making your, your cell phones nowhere near you. So the environment does change our behavior because of the contingencies that are in place. All right, so why are we all here? My kid is misbehaving. Help! Don't worry, it's not just your kid. All kids engage in problem behaviors at some point in time in their lives. Challenging behavior, however, it may, it may appear is a form of communication. It's just not in the most pleasant manner. So what are some of the ways that your kids misbehave? Just throw out a couple examples. Any examples at all? I know one that my kid does is she'll throw toys drives me absolutely crazy, but she'll throw toys, and most of the time it's for attention. All right, we'll move on. So now what? 
Once you identify a behavior that you would like to stop, there are three crucial steps to success. Number one is identify why the behavior is occurring. Number two, respond appropriately to the behavior. And number three, teach a replacement behavior. So why is the behavior occurring? There are four main functions of problem behavior, or four main functions of behavior in general. One is for attention. Two is for escape. Three is for access to tangible items. And four is automatic reinforcement. So for attention, the individual engages in the behavior in order to receive attention from those in the environment. Parents, teacher, sibling, peers. Attention can both be positive and negative. So positive attention would be praise, clapping, laughter, cheering, all of those happy moments. Negative attention, on the other hand, can be scolding, reprimanding, yelling, telling them not to do something, even though you think it's a punishment because you're yelling or saying no, it's actually, a it can be attention and just in a negative manner. Another function of behavior is escape. So in this one, the individual engages in the behavior in order to get out of doing something that he or she does not want to do. So it's to avoid, delay, or remove something non-preferred or aversive. How many times do our kids flop on the floor and scream because it's bath time because they want to escape going going to the bath because they know bath time means bedtime. The next one is access to tangible items. The individual engages in the behavior in order to get a preferred item, activity, or environment. So they want something that you or somebody else has. This is a big one with younger kids. And the next one is automatic sensory. So this one is not as common, but the individual engages in behavior for sensory or internal input. The response itself is what maintains and strengthens the behavior. This can be considered repetitive or ritualistic. For an example of um, a behavior that I engage in as an adult as an automatic sensory behavior is I'll twirl my hair while watching TV. I don't even realize I'm doing it all of the time, but it is a sensory behavior because I'm doing it. The feeling of twirling my hair is what's maintaining that behavior. So here's a functional example, and then I'm going to release a poll, um, and I want you to try to guess what the function of this behavior is. So here's the antecedent. So an antecedent is what happens before the behavior. A consequence is what happens after the behavior. So this is what we call ABC collection, antecedent behavior consequence. So the antecedent is Sarah sees her brother playing with the iPad. Sarah cries and hits her brother. The consequence was parents give Sarah their iPhone instead. What do you think is the function of this behavior? I'm going to go ahead and release this one. We'll launch the poll. Got about 20 seconds to respond. All right, I'll go ahead and share the results with you guys. So we've got one for tangible and one for automatic sensory. So let's see. The antecedent was Sarah wanted something. The consequence was she was given a tangible item. So the function of this behavior would be tangible. So a more appropriate way to handle this behavior, we'll go over right now. Let me see if I can move this little black bar all the way. I don't know if this moves. Sorry guys. Nope, it's it. Well, 
better way to handle that behavior would be to uh, prompt appropriate communication. So once the child stops crying, prompt them to say, I want the iPad. Give them the language, make it easy for them, and then once they appropriately ask for the iPad, then provide that item. Okay, next one. So the antecedent is, mom says it's time to clean up your cars. The behavior was that Johnny flops and whines, and the consequence is that Johnny laid on the floor for 10 minutes and did not put his cars away. What do you think the function of this behavior is? I'll go ahead and release the poll for this one. Let's see. All right, let's show the results. And it looks like both of you on this training said that escape was the function. Let's check it out. Let's stop sharing the results. All right, functional examples. So what was the antecedent was that there was a demand in place. Mom said, hey, you need to go clean. And the consequence was he escaped the demand. So essentially he escaped. So that was the function. Good job, guys. So a more appropriate way to handle this is that mom is saying it's time to clean up. He flops and whines. So you repeat the direction and you prompt the completion So of cleaning up. So what this might look like is that you might be helping Johnny clean up the toys, hand over hand, you taking his hands and helping him clean up through the problem. He might be screaming and crying the whole time, but you're actually physically having him clean up. So he's not escaping that behavior. Another way that you can handle this behavior is that you can clean up most of the mess and leave two items out and be like, all right, you need to clean the rest up and then prompt the completion of the behavior prompt the completion of the task with a smaller amount of items. So in the consequences, he did not escape the demand here. All right, we've got one more functional example. So Tommy is laying in bed awake at 3 a.m. The behavior is that he's kicking the wall repeatedly and the consequence is that dad comes in and snuggles Tommy. Let me release the poll here so you guys can let me know what you think. Oh, sorry. Let's see. What do you think the function of this child's behavior is? All right, let's show the results. You guys are rock stars. You both said that he is doing this for attention. Let me stop the share. So yes, you're right. So there was attention deprivation. He was in bed, he was alone. And essentially by him kicking the wall repeatedly, he gained access to attention. So a more appropriate way to handle this would be ignoring it and then he goes back to sleep. So there's no attention given there. So the behavior of kicking the wall repeatedly does not gain access to adult attention. So we wanna teach him appropriate ways to get adult attention. So let me go back one more. I have a little quiz for you guys. So I have a short quiz and it's just, can you tell me what the four functions of behavior are. I'm gonna launch it. Can you select the four functions? Awesome, star students, 100%. We got attention, escape, 
access to tangible items, and automatic sensory. Good, now let's go in. Now let me know the functions of behavior. Let's go in and we're going to talk about some strategies to use. So when you're dealing with behavior at home, think about the ABCs. What happened before, what was the behavior, and what happened after. Once you can determine the function of the, your child's behavior is when you can start to think of strategies for how to handle that behavior. So here are some function-based strategies for attention-maintained behavior. So one of them is that to identify if there are certain moments that you know that the behavior is likely to happen. So some examples of this are like when you're on the phone, you're cooking dinner, you're busy talking to your, um, your husband or your wife, or, or you're just doing work on your computer. Now that a lot of people are working from home, attention is not freely given to children at home. So what you can do is you can provide free attention ahead of these moments. So for example, if you're about ready to cook dinner in 10 minutes and you know you're going to need a solid 30 minutes to prepare the food to put it up in the crock pot, spend that 10 minutes that you have before you need to start cooking, giving your child a lot of free attention. By giving them all of that free attention, it's something that we call satiation. So they're going to get a lot of attention. So they're not going to need it. Their bank is going to be full and then they're, they're less likely to engage in attention maintained behavior because they just had your attention prior to you engaging in the activity that was going to cause the, your attention to be withdrawn. That's one, one strategy. Another strategy would be to give your child a job or a task where they can receive attention appropriately. So being mommy or daddy's helper in this case. So you want your child to gain positive attention for doing the right things more often than they're receiving attention for engaging in inappropriate behaviors. So we wanna give them lots of things that they can do that they're receiving that positive attention from us. And another strategy, the third strategy I have on here is to teach appropriate ways to gain attention. Again, this ties into the giving them a job or a task. So when you've got the mom, 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 to get attention, teach them to tap you on the shoulder or saying, excuse me. And you wanna teach this skill prior to them going up to you and going, mom, 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 mom. Because if you try to teach that skill in the middle of that episode of mom, 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 you've just reinforced, I'm going to be super annoying and then I'm gonna get mom's attention for an extended period of time because she's now trying to teach me how to not be super annoying. So make sure that you're teaching those occurrences prior to that happening and really reinforcing and giving them positive praise for when they are getting your attention appropriately. And then if they are engaging in those mom, 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 even though it's super hard, ignore that don't give your attention to that because once you give in and give your attention that's now reinforcing that behavior because they gained access to attention so you want to teach them the appropriate way to get attention so review expectations and you want to errorlessly prompt your child if needed so you want to give them ample opportunities to practice the new behavior um, does anybody have any questions as of yet I feel like I'm just talking away. All right, no questions, we're gonna move on. The next function that we're going to go over is escape maintained behavior. So your child is trying to get out of doing something. So one way that you can work on this is that you're using directives, not questions. So instead of asking your child, can you put your shoes away? You tell them instead, put your shoes away. If you use a question and you say, can you put your shoes away? They have the opportunity to tell you no, because you're asking them a question. So it would be appropriate for saying, no, I don't wanna do that right now, because you are asking them, you're not telling them. So, and 
think of the way that you're verbalizing your statements. Is this something that I want to allow them to not do right now? Or is this something I need them to do? Like I need them to clean up and put their shoes away. So think about the way that you're wording your sentences to your children. The next strategy is using first then statements. So this is what we call grandma's law. So first you do your homework, then you can go outside. So letting them know what they're going to get if they do that non-preferred task. Like, nope, you gotta do your homework, but then you get to do this super awesome thing like go outside. Or some kids are totally into playing video games. So first they need to do something, then they get the reinforcer. So they get the fun activity. The next one is write out or use picture schedules to prepare for difficult tasks or transitions. So you, this allows for built-in opportunities for fun or motivation. So a lot of times when we're using this, you could do one fun thing. So always start with something super reinforcing and fun. So do a fun thing and then do something a little bit more challenging, more eh, I don't really wanna do this one, but I just did a fun thing, I'm not gonna do this thing. But then right after this, I get to do another fun thing. So you alternate, fun, work, fun, work. And through this, it can help with difficult tasks or transitions because they have something positive to look forward to. Another strategy we have is to enrich the environment or activity. So you wanna make escape less valuable. You want them to want to be there. If escape is more valuable than doing the task, of course they're gonna to wanna to get out of it because they don't wanna be there. So make it so they wanna be there. We have two strategies in ABA. We have a high P sequence and a low P sequence. So low P means low probability sequence. So there's a low probability that your child is going to engage in this behavior. So let me show you what a low P looks like. Dion, it's time for shower. I don't want to shower. So in that example, she jumped right in and said, hey, let's go take a shower. So she didn't build up the motivation to go take a shower. He just was like, nope, time to go take a shower. And he got, he was naughty. He didn't, he was like, no, I don't want a shower. He was crabby. So that's what we call low probability request sequence. So what we suggest doing is using a high probability request sequence. So you're going to ask your child to engage in a few behaviors that have a high probability that they will follow through with them. And then you ask them the challenging task. And because they've built up motivation and they've been complying, 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 difficult tasks get asked, oh, I might as well comply because I've been complying. So let me show you what a high probability request sequence would look like. Dion, say, Harry McClary. Harry McClary, we stuck you. So do this. So she ignored Whee! that vocalization. Whee! Touch your nose. One, two, two, three. Great touching. Now off to the shower. It's time for shower. Who are you taking? Uh, uh, I suppose. So in that video clip, she started with some very easy tasks like touch your nose, say Harry McClary, even though he did say a vocalization like stop you after that, she just ignored that because he was looking for some sort of attention. So she ignored it and went on asking him easy tasks and then she said, oh, it's time for shower. He still wasn't going. So she gave him the opportunity to bring something fun with him. Like, oh, who are you bringing to the shower today? So then he got up and he chose who he was bringing to the shower with him. How are we doing, ladies? Do we have any questions so far? No. Nope, awesome. Okay, I will move on. All right, so these strategies are for if your child is engaging in behaviors to gain access to items. So this is what we call tangible. 
So what one way that you can do that you could treat this is that you could deliver freebies. So this is just free access to preferred items or edibles because some of the children on our spectrum that in our clinics will eat edibles for reinforcement because they have limited access to other reinforcers. So you could deliver freebies and you wanna do this at a quicker rate than problem behavior occurs. So if you know that your child is, hasn't had access to the iPad all day long and you know it's about 15 minutes before dinner and he's about to lose it because he hasn't had it all day, you can go ahead and give it to him before he has problem behavior as a freebie. Hey, I love the way that you are sitting patiently. Here, here's some iPad time. And by doing this, you are beating them to engaging in problem behavior, to gain access to items. So you're building, you can also build motivation and use language to communicate with this too if your child has issues communicating. The next one is that teach them to communicate their wants and needs using modeling or verbal prompts. So if your child is tantruming because they want cookies or crackers in this example, they're crying and whining, have them stop crying and whining so you might need to wait it out and then prompt them say, I want to eat crackers and then have them say the sentence or say the word that you want them to say. So that way you're reinforcing appropriate communication instead of the whining and the screaming and the crying. Another strategy is to use countdowns to prepare the child for the removal of preferred items. So you can give them warnings like one minute left, 30 seconds left. You can do countdowns, three, two, one, it's my turn. Um, there's even a lot of like free apps on, uh, in the app store that you can get with visual timers. So you can actually watch the little timer clock down, count down. And sometimes that more concrete visual is good for children. Another one is that, that we use is uh, promissory reinforcers. So this is when you give them a lesser preferred item to get that high preferred back. So you could trade your child an M&M to get the iPad back. Like, All right, it's my turn with the iPad, but you can have this M&M. So you're reinforcing the behavior of them giving the items up appropriately, and then you can fade out giving them that promise reinforcer over time. But if you're having a really hard time getting items back, that's a good way to reinforce the appropriate giving up of reinforcing items. Any questions on tangible yet? I don't have any questions. Nothing? Okay. All right, automatic sensory. So these can be difficult behaviors to assess and treat, and you need to be extremely ethical in the treatment decisions of automatically maintained behaviors. So you have to pick your battles. Does the behavior interfere with the child's ability to function throughout their day? Does it affect safety or health risk? Does it decrease access to learning or decrease access to social opportunities? So some general rules of thumb, and this is for all functions of behavior. You first wanna prioritize safety. You wanna to respond to problem behavior in a calm and neutral tone. This is really hard when you're in that heat of the moment and you just want to explode. So you need to remember, take a deep breath yourself and you want to be calm and neutral when dealing with problem behavior because your reaction might actually reinforce that problem behavior. So if you remain calm and neutral, your child is not getting that amped up reaction that they might be looking for. So you might need to take a step away, take a deep breath before you react. Try not to take problem behavior personally. It's not us. It's something that's going on in their environment and they're trying to communicate. So remember your child is trying to communicate something, just not appropriately. And we need to figure out how, what they're communicating and how to teach them how to appropriately communicate. This bolded bottom one is essential consistency and follow through. 
if my, oh, the next slide goes over this. So what does it mean to be consistent? If you say something, for example, if you don't eat your vegetables, then you can't have dessert. You need to stick with the consequence that was stated. If you do not, they're going to know that even though mom says I don't have to eat my vegetables, I'm still going to get dessert like two hours later because mom's going to give in. You need to stay consistent. Otherwise, your words don't mean anything, and they're going to know that you're going to break at some point. So if you say something, stick with it. All caregivers need to be on the same page. If mom says no, I'll go to dad. Mom and dad, same page. If mom says no, the answer is no with dad. Same thing with grandmas and grandpas. Make sure everyone is on the exact same page when it comes to uh, your child's wants and needs. The next one is if you make it a rule, it needs to stay a rule. So for example, no eating in the living room. And then what can happen is that when you allow exceptions, that is when you can step into trouble because they're gonna be like, well, that one time you let me eat popcorn on the couch and now I wanna eat dinner in there. Why can't I eat my sloppy joe on the couch? Because I had popcorn in there and then you're going to get into these battles. So if you make it a rule, keep it a rule. It makes your life easier. Any questions here? No, okay. So we at EPI have something called Parent Academy. So it is an online support system that provides you module, modules, much like kind of how we virtually went through this training, created by parents and professionals to watch as they explore common challenging behaviors and determine how to tackle them. So they go way more in depth than what this training went into. So there's downloadable and printable data sheets and materials for use. There's uh, first done boards, visual schedule templates, visuals, and a ton more um, resources for you guys. Um, there's also an invitation to join a private Facebook community where you have access to a BCBA for any general questions. You can watch parents present live on their own experiences, get daily tips, and interact with families just like yourselves. Um, so I will send the link for you guys to register if you're interested. And then also BPI, we have Apple Academy. It's where therapy meets fun. Uh, fun. So Apple Academy, it provides a multidisciplinary approach. So currently in the Illinois region, we have speech and ABA. So Apple Academy strives to improve behavior and communication in children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders. Apple Academy provides individualized programming, and it provides a one-to-one -one staff ratio to optimize learning opportunities. Currently in Northern Illinois, we have Apple Academy locations in Aurora, Oswego, Lake in the Hills, and Plano, with more, more to come soon. And in Central Illinois, we have Springfield and Champaign, and we have one clinic in Austin, Texas. So I wanted to thank you for attending. Do either of you have any questions? Do you have any specific examples you wanna go over? Let me go ahead and stop the recording. So if you have questions, they're not recorded.